Hey, what's good, everybody? I'm Justin Miller, host and owner of the Legends of Athletics podcast. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to give an opportunity for you guys to take a moment and go and hit the link for our guest today. He has a book called The Yielding Warrior, which is out now. We have the link in the description, but also in our show notes for you that want to purchase it. This book talks about the power of meditation, finding your inner strength, and staying grounded in a world full of distractions. This book is authored by Mr. Jeff Patterson, who has over 30 years of experience in a meditative space. If you want to, you can follow the, the prompt that is on the screen or in the show notes. But if you want to purchase this book and you may be driving right now, uh, go to book.theyieldingwarrior.com slash free dash plus dash shipping. Again, that's book.theyieldingwarrior.com slash free dash plus dash shipping. And that book will be available to you. Let's jump into the show. Hey, everybody. I'm Justin Miller, host and owner of the Legends of Athletics podcast. This is another fresh episode. Episode 124 is uh, the number of this one. So we've been at it for a while. And of course, Anybody that has listened to this podcast over the years know that we try to expand ourselves and be very versatile and very rich in what we do and and hit as many disciplines as possible. Today is going to be very different uh, because this is the first time I've gotten a chance to talk to someone who is in the meditative meditative space, but also the space of martial arts, you, you would say, and that space of knowing how to, uh, in the words of uh, Bruce Lee, become water and so uh, this is going to be a very a very good episode one that i learned from and one that I, I hope that i'm asking questions that listeners um are interested in knowing and we can all learn something and take something away that we can add into our lives as we currently live it and so before i give the the floor to mr uh jeff patterson i want to make sure that i go and give him his flowers before before he even speaks, we want to make sure we take care of him, all right? So, Mr. Patterson is from Southern Oregon. He's a former Marine. He's trained over 25,000 students in his 30-year career as a trainer, and he uh, studied at Portland State University. And I don't want to mess this up because I just asked him before we got on. So, he is the Sifu of Tai Chi and Qigong. And I may be putting so much of a Southern twang on that. But I tried to do my best, and so he's he he has also authored two books. The Yielding Warrior is one that he has currently out, uh, as well as How to Meditate, and those are some of his accomplishments. He has a very extensive resume that I haven't even hit half of what he has accomplished in his thirty-year career. And I want to allow you the floor, Mr. Patterson, to um to allow the audience to know a little bit about yourself on some things that I may not have have hit. Yeah, so I've been running my academy for about 30 years. <clears throat> At the academy here, we have four different programs. We have our meditative program, which you mentioned, the Tai Chi and Qigong and various forms of sitting and standing meditation along with breath work. And then we have our Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu program, which is more of a combative martial art. We have our striking program, which does Western boxing and Muay Thai kickboxing. And then we have our JKD and Eskrima program, which is more geared towards the Filipino kind of stick and knife fighting element of mm -hmm. the training. Uh, the book that I just put out, The Yielding Warrior, that's more about kind of the philosophy and the meditative arts and how to incorporate those in your everyday life, along with using those for performance if you're an athlete or a competitor in any of the combative sports. So what that, that I like the title of The Yielding Warrior. <clears throat> What um uh, what helped you come up with that title of the yielding? I just that's not something that's on the books, but I like the title of it. It, it uh, I feel like it's very self explanatory. So, yielding is one of the concepts in martial arts, and it's been used for generations. Uh, the idea of yielding <clears throat> is, say, I push you and you push me. Whoever's the bigger, stronger person with the most leverage is going to push the other person over. But with yielding. Instead of us seeing who the bigger meathead is, when you push me, I get out of the way of that force, and then I can respond with less effort. And it's mm -hmm. obvious how this is helpful in a martial arts scenario. If I'm walking down the street and I come up against some guy who's 250 pounds and can pick up a Volkswagen bug, I don't want to wrestle right. that guy to the ground. I want to yield to his force and maybe go around and try to choke him out if I'm going to survive that encounter. 
Mm-hmm. Now, so because we've been using this for generations in martial arts, there's been a lot of other life applications that come from the concept of yielding. In sports, we use yielding all the time in any kind of athletics, not just combative arts, but that would be what we call physical yielding. And then there's the idea of mental yielding. And mental yielding is a pretty cool concept. And it's the idea that once we develop the skills of yielding and can listen internally and see things more clearly inside ourselves, like how we are more rooted, more relaxed, uh, our breath, where we're transferring energy from one side to the other, our mental state, you start to see those things more clearly inside yourself. You also Mm -hmm. start to see them more clearly in other people. So say, for example, I say something to you that unsettles you and I pick up on it when it's like this. It's a lot easier to adjust the conversation and keep us in a happy place then if I'm not paying attention to that, and pretty soon I'm so far off track, you want to knock me upside the head. Well, right, right, right. Using yielding in all of your interactions, one, you're just being more considerate, and two, it helps you to guide conversations, guide anything you're doing in business, whether it's sales, whether it's a confrontation, to guide it in a positive direction with the least amount of resistance. And so that would be what we call mental yielding. Then there's also emotional yielding and emotional yielding is very much like mental yielding, but with our own interpersonal conflicts. So you think about when something happens to us, oftentimes we'll respond and we'll go down this road and we might get an hour a day, a week down that road and realize maybe that wasn't the best choice. Well, with yielding, if we could have noticed it when it was like this, it's a lot easier to step back and say, ah, maybe this is a better approach. And so a lot of times it can save us a lot of heartache on the other side. And you know, the, the funny thing is, is I've explained this when pe- people ask about what yielding is all the time. And over and over again, I'll hear people say, ah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I do that all the time. And, you know, they're right. Everybody does this to some degree all the time. But it's mm-hmm. kind of like, You know, if you or I were to walk into a crime scene with a detective who's been on the job for 30 years, he would see things about that series of events and the things that Mm -hmm. happened that we would have no clue of. And the meditative arts helps us see things that the average person is never going to have any clue of without this idea of the practice. And it's kind of like, you know, when you look at athletics, you... It's if you have a good coach and a good group of athletes, it's pretty easy to get those athletes to 80, 85% of their potential. But to get them to 90%, 95%, 97%, you know, mm-hmm. now you're talking about like the Michael Jordans and the Kobe Bryants mm-hmm. who are almost magical, right? Yep. Those guys, they, they make it look special. Well, with what we're talking about here and seeing things clearly in yourself and other people, there's no way you could get to that 95, 97% without the meditative arts. And so it really is a tool that you could use in so many different directions anywhere in life. Yeah. And I I was going to like listening to you speak, it kind of got my wheels spinning. And I know those, those are probably some things that we're going to get to a little bit later. Um, but that is correct. I mean, it's hard. I think what's hard is having the ability to unlock that last 15, 10 to 15% of your mind to allow you to go to the different spaces that you need to navigate in order to be your best self, to perform at your highest level, or to even achieve a goal that is probably bigger than yourself of where you currently are. And so I think that meditation. Um, is a great tool for that. Now, me speaking from the term of what the average person probably thinks when you think meditation, you think of the old uh, sitting in the middle of the floor, legs crossed, got the hands up and just letting your mind um, home or go into space. And as you kind of pointed out, even in that, that, that illustration to start the show, is there are three different forms that you hit in that example. And so I guess what got you into the space of learning meditation or traveling the road to, to mastering 
uh, meditation or meditative practices? Well, it's a it's a bit of a funny story in that I wasn't looking to start a meditative practice at all. I was a young guy. Mm -hmm. I was really into Western boxing and I just wanted to be a better boxer. I used to go to this gym <clears throat> just a few blocks here from my academy called Grand Avenue Boxing Gym. And back then mm -hmm. it was, this is in the late eighties, early nineties. And this is when, you know, back then it was the only gym in Portland really for, for boxing and, and all the amateurs and pros that would come through town would go there to spar and, and train. Well, there was a coach there who was a very well-known coach and had trained national and world champion level fighters. And I really wanted to get to spend some time with him. And so I'd always show up at the gym and I knew he was going to be there and ask him questions yeah. and try to spend a little bit of time with him when I could. Uh, finally, after following him around for about three or four months, he decided to take me on as one of his fighters and started training me. Well, something happened about two or three weeks into it that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. And that he told me, and remember, I'm a pretty young guy at this point in time. He said, mm -hmm. you know, if you really want to be a good fighter, you should start doing meditation and Tai Chi. And here I am thinking, you know, isn't that for like old people in the park? You know, how, how's that going <laughs> to, how's that going to yeah. help me be a better fighter? You know, but I had a lot of respect for him. And so I started doing the practice and in the first couple of weeks, he showed me the first couple movements of a Tai Chi form. And now you could show somebody this in one session. He told me that I should be doing about an hour a day. And everything he gave me back then, I treated like it was gold. You know, I just, I really wanted mm -hmm. to get the most out of it. So I was doing an hour and a half every day of personal practice for my meditative practice because I really wanted to impress him. Well, right. Three or four months goes by and he hadn't shown me anything else. I'm still working those three moves and I started getting frustrated. I'm thinking, how, <laughs> what, what the hell is, how's this going to help me? Right. You know, and yeah. so I was, I'm down there every day and, you know, I'd go to the gym five, six days a week. And the last thing I would want was to him to ask me, Hey, did you do your meditation today? And to have to tell him no. So I did it religiously mm -hmm. every single day. And Something happened at about maybe six or seven months into this. I went down to my basement to train and I started going through the practice and I looked up at the clock and an hour and a half had gone by and it felt like 15 minutes. And I, I couldn't believe what happened. It was kind of like an aha moment, you know, it just was like, what was that? And from that point on, I started really getting inspired and really wanting to dive into the practice and started seeing all of the possibilities. And I'm sure he saw this change in my energy and my attitude yeah, towards it. Because mm -hmm. after he noticed this, he showed me the rest of the form in about a two to three week window. And this is, you know, we're talking after like six, seven months of sitting around grinding out these two, three movements that right. was, was pretty difficult and challenging mentally. I think I'm listening to you and I, what I, I'm gathering is the discipline of it all, uh, the discipline to, to stay with something that long, especially in society, uh, the society that we live in today, that's very difficult. To to be that patient and to stay the course and stick with something in order to, I guess, get the lesson from it. So what was the, I guess, what was the the lesson or the goal that he was intending for you to reach by being disciplined in the practice of uh, an, an hour of meditation or an hour of uh, Tai Chi, I'm sorry, an hour of Tai Chi uh, per day? Well, there's a, there's a lot of things, a lot of benefits that come with a meditative practice. And, you know, a, a lot of reasons why athletes take to a meditative practice to help improve their performance. One is just to improve their overall awareness of themselves. Mm -hmm. If you have a heightened sense of awareness, your reaction time is faster, your, your mental space is more present so you can respond in the moment and uh, perform at a higher level. But mm -hmm. when you start to see those things inside yourself, you also start to see them in your competitors and the people that you're 
you're going up against. And when you can right, see right, right. those things at a higher level, you can have an advantage, you know, and in boxing, you know, that's because that's what I got started with. Everything is fast. You know, if you have to think about, hey, this guy's throwing a punch at me, you already got hit three times. And so right. you, you really got to be in the moment and just feel it. And meditation helps you get to a deeper level of feeling. With, with the meditative arts, whether it's Tai Chi, Qigong, Bagua, Xing Yi, sitting meditation, yoga, whatever it is, what gets you to a high level of practice in any one of those areas is a deeper level of feeling. And the only way that you're going to get to that deeper level of feeling is to put the time in, have a consistent practice, right. and really get to the point where you can listen and be aware. All right, so you guys have been listening to the show. This is a midpoint. I want to take a little break for those that maybe skipped over the first part. I know some of y'all be going through real quick, but um, we want to take a quick break to off offer you the opportunity to purchase the Yielding Warrior book, which can be purchased at book.theyieldingwarrior.com slash free dash plus dash shipping. Again, that's book.theyieldingwarrior.com slash free dash shipping dash plus and this is going to be your opportunity to purchase a book which only costs you the cost of shipping learn how to overcome life's adversities learn how to stay grounded and also learn how to find your inner peace and inner strength in the world that we live in today if this is something that sounds uh exciting to you and sounds like something that you could use as another tool in your life then don't hesitate to purchase and as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, rate this podcast, let somebody know about it, share it with someone, and be legendary. Back to the show. So is that something more so that you would say brings you to a point of more self-awareness of what you can and can't do? Or is it more, I guess, like more like feeling what you would feel, let's say it's an opponent. And like you said, you can see the things in an opponent. Is it more feeling what you would feel and you can recognize and see it in your opponent? Or is it more self-awareness of who you are and what you are not in that moment? And that person may be feeling the same way. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It makes sense the way I, I worded it or not. Yeah. So I think in a sense, yes, it does help with your sense of, of personal awareness and the awareness of an opponent. But once you see things before they get too far out of pr proportion, so for example, mm -hmm. <clears throat> say, for, say uh, uh, I'm chasing you and we're running down the street and you're only mm -hmm. five feet ahead of me, I'm going right. to feel pretty confident I'm going to catch you, right? But if right, you're right. three blocks away, I'm just going to be like, go ahead, you yeah. know? And, <laughs> you, you know, yeah. By, by having that increased awareness, you start to see things when they're like this. And when you can right. see them when they're small, it's a lot easier to lead them to the outcome you want to see. Mm -hmm. what, you, what you're saying is, is, has made me, so one of my favorite boxers, or my favorite boxer inside the ring, of course, is Mike Tyson. And I heard him in some of his interviews talk about he would look at his opponent's eyes, and if their eyes moved once, he knew he had them. And this is before they even fought. And uh, he talked about his trainer, Custy Amato, and the things that he kind of, I guess, mentally got him to the place, kind of like you were talking about with the guy that trained you, got him to the place of uh, studying the, the art of war, studying warriors, and the mindset of a warrior. And so listening to you kind of ex ex explain that, has put it more into perspective of his tra his train of thought more so than the I guess just the abstract way that I looked at it initially as as black and white and just saying like oh this is the way he thought this then the third but you talking about the meditative practice puts that more into perspective also uh thinking to some athletes that use things such as uh visualization and things like that um just listening to you talk makes it helps to paint the picture more and frame it more to make sense in a place of stress. And I think this is one of the questions I may have had a little further down, but in a place of stress, right? So for uh, an athlete or somebody maybe working a high, high, uh, high stress job or something like that, 
in the moment of of those stressors, how would one yield? Let's let's use that term. How would one yield and allow their mind to take them to a place of clarity, like you're saying, where they can be self aware, where they can think through the game plan of what they need to do and what they don't need to do. Um, and as you said, uh, the last thing you said, guide their opponent to the places they want them to go and not get control, not be controlled by what's happening in front of them. So I see a couple directions in that question. Uh, the first one, if you're stressed and you're feeling out of balance, which we all do every day, you know, you're, you, nobody's mm-hmm. ever in perfect balance, right? With meditation, you know, I've heard so many people through the years come to me and say, you know, I've tried meditation and it didn't work for me because I couldn't quiet the mind. Meditation isn't about quieting the mind. It's about developing that muscle to bring yourself back to focus. So Mm. when you're meditating and you get distracted and you start going down this path, it's your job to bring you back to center and try to resonate and be more at peace. And you Mm. might do that a thousand times in one meditation. And that doesn't mean you failed because you were distracted a thousand times. That means you got a thousand reps of getting back to center. Think about how much better and how much more in tune you're going to be with bringing yourself back to that center. Well, you do this over and over again every day. And, you know, the most important thing with any meditative practice is having a ritual practice that you do a little bit every day. Mm -hmm. If you start doing that and you have the power to bring yourself mentally back to focus, when you start getting stressed or feeling overwhelmed, You can use that to come back to center and not let that get you too far off track. You know, and we all go through the days with emotional ups and downs. If you're like a roller coaster and you have high peaks and low valleys, it's Mm -hmm. really difficult to change when you're at an all time low or an all time high. But when you start seeing things being a little bit more smooth and you start to change and keep it more balanced along the way. That's one of the things meditation does, and we do that with the breath. So, you know, Qigong is often referred to as the science of the breath. And there's hundreds of different breathing strategies. And when you start learning how to use the breath, you can lead that to different outcomes. And so, for example, we broadly categorize the breath into yin methods and yang methods. Yin methods are often deeper, more holistic style of meditation. So an example of a yin breath would be if you ever listen to somebody sleep, their natural breathing pattern is a longer inhale and a shorter Mm -hmm. exhale. And that's the body's natural way of bringing your conscious mind into your subconscious mind, which is where we are when we're sleeping and dreaming. And so if we want to emulate that, We can do longer inhales in our meditations, maybe soft retentions at the end of the inhale and shorter exhales. And this will bring our energy inward and it's very calming and relaxing. And so if we're in a stressful type situation, we -hmm. could use this yin side of the breath to help bring that stress level down. Now, the, the flip side of that, the yang side of the breath. Now we're talking about like you ever had to push your car, you pick up something heavy, Mm -hmm. your natural instinct is uh, use the exhale Mm -hmm. side of the breath, maybe put tension in the breath, make the breath audible. That helps generate energy and power. Now that also helps us with our creativity. It helps us if we have a weakened immune system. If you were Mm -hmm. somebody coming to me for the meditative practice that's recovering from chemotherapy, we would do a lot of yang, aggressive breathing strategies to help build and strengthen the immune system. And so you can learn to use the breath to get different physical, mental, and emotional outcomes. And in Chinese philosophy, they call this balancing the Khan and Li or the fire and water. And so we use that in all of our meditative practices that we're doing, whether they're ritual practices or active practices. Yes, sir. So I know whenever you message me i i think this is a good point to kind of allow allow you to explain more to us in this this point you were talking about the five regulations to become more grounded while stressful 
in, or or we label this as being more stressful in sports in their life. What are the five regulations? Um, yeah. So the five regulations are kind of a foundation of any meditative practice. And one is regulating the body, regulating the breath, mm -hmm. regulating the mind, regulating the energy, and regulating the spirit. Regulating the body is the easiest one to integrate into our lives. It just takes a few months of dedicated practice to really be conscious of it, to see how we feel and can manipulate the body. An example would be, you know, if you're sitting at your computer all day with your shoulders rounded over like this, mm -hmm. and you do that yeah. for four or five hours, you're going to feel tight, you're going to feel depleted. And the other side of that, if you were to visualize, you know, I don't know who's a um, your biggest fan, but if, you know, if Michael Jordan was to walk in the room, you would perk up and have a lot of energy and yeah. be excited and, and stoked that right, he right. was coming in. And that is all with your physiology, right? And so we can control mm -hmm. that. But oftentimes, the average person, every, and really everybody, has ups and downs with that. And so the, the posture is really important on our overall energetic state. The next yes, element is the breath. And the breath is very difficult and takes really years and years of practice to really regulate the breath. And the point is to get to where you can regulate the breath without having to consciously think of it. And in the beginning, you need to work on the breath in your ritual practices and in your active practices. And what I mean by an active practice, since we haven't talked about that yet, an active practice is something where you're doing a breathing exercise, you're doing an energetic circulation, you're doing some form of a awareness training exercise mm -hmm. all day, every day. And you can do that when you're walking down the street or standing in line at the grocery store. And the more that we incorporate those into our lives, the more we start to let meditation and the meditative arts be come a way of life and less of a hobby that we're doing once in a while. And that's really the goal of the practice. And so that breath work is something that, you know, even you meditate for the next 30 years, you'll always be working on getting to a deeper level with the practice. Next, you have regulating the mind. And the mind, again, just like the breath, is very difficult and takes years and years to really be in control. And, you know, we talked earlier about developing that muscle of distraction and coming back to center with our focus when we're mm -hmm. doing the meditation. Mental exercises are like that. You know, the mind, we have our, what we call our wisdom mind, and we have our monkey mind. Most of us get so distracted with our monkey mind where, you know, we've got all these distractions all day, every day that are taking us one way and the other. And the idea is with okay. meditation is using the wisdom mind to help control the monkey mind. And we use the breath as a tool to help guide that monkey, basically to give him a banana and lead him mm -hmm. to where you want to go. And so if you can get to the point where you can regulate the breath and regulate the mind at a very high level, then the next right. stage of regulating the energy is easy. But until you can regulate the mind and the breath, regulating the energy is very difficult. And the exactly. energetic circulations in the body we do to get different outcomes, as we mentioned before, with the breath leading the energy inward, which is where we get closer to the subconscious mind and helping us mm -hmm. be more relaxed or more energetic if we want to lead the energy outward. Lastly, oh, go ahead. Did you have a question? I know, I'm listening. I'm listening to you because uh, that it, what you're just saying with the energy made a lot of sense as far as uh, you know if your mind's not settled, then I feel like the 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 breath or you know your internal along with your energy. I think those two trend together or correlate each one another because I know for me if my mind isn't settled, my energy is everywhere, up and down, and it's it's not really bottled up or controlled and focused. Um, at the task that I that I have to complete, so I, I I'm just saying I just was agreeing with you. Yeah, and then the the last area is regulating the spirit, and 
this is very profound and difficult and takes a lifetime to work towards uh, a simple idea of the spirit is a lot of times when we get excited, our body gets tight. You know, you, you tense up and mm. you, you, you get that sense of excitement. Whereas we want to be able to have that level of excitement internally and feel that mm -hmm that energy and that sense of awareness, but at the same time, sink the energy and be relaxed so we can be present in the moment. And if you're ever in that flow state, you're that point where things just come effortlessly and feels almost a little bit magical, that's what's right. happening is your body is relaxed and, and upright with good posture. Your energy is sinking, but your spirit is elevated. And when that spirit is elevated, everything works almost like a symphony and it really comes together very well. And I think a lot of people will experience little glimpses of this, but in order mm -hmm. to control that and make it happen at will is a lifetime practice. That's pretty interesting. I mean, you, you are taking me down a, a much steeper a, a rabbit hole of meditation than what I was previously um, previously knew. And even, you know, before we jumped on, it's just a lot of a lot of great thinking points. I think um, or I know that when I try med meditation before really getting serious about it, it was kind of like you said, whenever you were um, talking sporadic and looking for a fix that happened pretty quickly. Because a lot of people talk about the benefits of meditation, but it just takes practice just like any other skill. If you never work on the skill, you don't get better at it, just like exercise. If you don't exercise, you don't get stronger. And so if you don't exercise that muscle, then you kind of leave it there to atrophy or get weaker over time. And therefore, lifting weights one time doesn't get you in shape, nor does it get you stronger, just like meditating one time doesn't, doesn't fix every problem that you have. And so for me, I think the power of the mind is very underestimated by many people. Uh, as far as where it can take you in, in your practice of, of skill, of uh, knowledge, and even as you talked about flow state um, and relaxation. I think um, with today, social media, especially a lot of times our brains are overexcited and it's hard to get to that state of where we're able to bring ourselves down into a more relaxed state. I know for me, one thing that I try to pay attention to is my breathing. Um, I used to be, or still now, if I don't catch myself, I breathe through my chest a lot uh, versus through my stomach. And I can tell the difference as far as like, I don't know. It's just, I don't really know how to explain it. That may be the spiritual side of things. I don't know how to explain it, but I can just feel the difference of when I'm, when I breathe through my chest, I'm very tight and compressed and just very rigid versus when I'm breathing through my stomach, I'm more relaxed and able to, it actually helps me to think more freer and, and more in a flowing state where I can come up with more ideas and more things and go more, di more directions. I feel like when I breathe through my chest, I'm more at a stressful stress time and stress is, is good in certain, certain avenues, but certain avenues, it kind of hinders you from exploring those ideas and things like that, because you put the blinders on to what you got going on in front of you, uh, which may be like a fight or flight response versus anything else and so i definitely um agree and like i said it's just a lot of great thinking points of how to incorporate that not only for athletes but also in my own personal life and um i think that brings me to the next thing i was kind of looking at this question before and, and kind of hopping around but how do the five regulations lead you to living um, a healthier life naturally Well, I think it comes back to the overall practice, you know, and the five regulations are kind of the foundation of a meditative practice. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing a ritual practice every day, you are working on active practices, philosophical practices, and you're training your body, training your breath, training your mind, um, training, learning how to guide the energy to lead you in a positive direction. All of these things lead to thousands of benefits you know there there's so many benefits from a meditative practice with your overall just mental well-being and positive outlook but also your health and wellness and physiology as well and all of that mm -hmm. you know all of that is really related you know and you talk about 
the chest breathing and the breath, you know, you know, most people only use 40 to 60% of their lung capacity. And one of the most, one of the most important things that helps influence the energy in the body is the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange in the body. And so if we're only using 40 or 50% of our lung capacity, our, we're breathing shallow and the lungs are very much like any other muscle in the body. If you're only, if you have poor posture and your shoulders are rounded forward and you're just breathing into the front side of your lungs all the time, the back sides and the, and the sides of your lungs are going to start getting mm-hmm. stiff because they're not getting exercised and they're not going to be as, as strong and as healthy. And so learning how to regulate the breath and improve our lung capacity improves this oxygen carbon dioxide exchange which powers and fuels the cells in the body and you know every day trillions of cells die in the body and then are rebuilt Mm -hmm. every day and if we're not supplying the body with enough oxygen these cells aren't coming back as healthy and so this one idea of learning how to be more full with the breath and exercise those lungs is just going to help our overall energetic state in multiple ways. Yes, sir. That's a, I don't know. I guess it's a lot that I'm learning. I, I, I'm liking it. So I'm gonna keep asking you questions. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna <laughs> let you, I'm gonna let you keep, keep doing your thing. I, I, I like where we're going. So talking about performance, optimal performance of uh, using Qigong and meditation. How does that aid us in performing at our absolute best, whether we're in business, the business arena, the sports arena, training, wherever we are, how does that help us perform at our optimal capacity? Many, in many ways, and to give you a couple of examples, if you can learn to have a negotiation without conflict and notice how to lead things in a positive direction that gets to the outcome that you want to achieve, you can have a lot more advantage. Meditation Mm -hmm. helps us see things like I was mentioning when they're like this. And if we can take that and guide that in a positive direction or the direction we want it to go, Mm -hmm. that's how, that's one way it can help us in conversations or in business. In athletics, when you're out on the field and you're training, if you can learn to read other people and notice the subtle change of their energetic state and notice things that, you know, it's, it's easy if you see somebody step into their right foot, you know their next movement is going to be going to the left because they're pushing off exactly. of their right, right? Well, exactly. in, in boxing, you everything is very still and you've got yeah. to you know you've got to see things you got to almost see the thought you know when somebody thinks they're <laughs> going to punch you got to be able yeah. to feel it and meditation helps you get to the point where you can see that energetic change in the body without having to notice when they're taking a step and when you can develop that kind of fine tuned awareness you know and Somebody who definitely understood this very well was Phil Jackson. You know, he used to have all of his players when he was coaching the Chicago Bulls and the L.A. Lakers. He would have them practicing Tai Chi and yoga and meditation to help them perform better on the court. You know, and those are, you know, those are two of the most successful teams in history, you know. So Mm -hmm. it it definitely works on an athletic front. So how can, I guess, what a beginner, where would you where would you suggest a beginner starts in a meditative practice regardless of what they're doing where would you i always you recommend i always recommend that you start with about 20 minutes a day of a ritual practice and when i say ritual practice that means no cell phones no tvs no audios just going in and doing your your breath work and that could be in a sitting practice it could be a standing meditation a walking meditation a tai chi or a qigong set something mm-hmm. where you're doing that for 20 minutes a day at a minimum and you have that ritual is kind of like something that you do every day like brushing your teeth once exactly. you have that as your foundation 
then incorporating active practices into your day. And these can be done in as little as 90 seconds or two minutes or 10 minutes if you like, but just coming back to them to bring yourself that sense of awareness and that feeling throughout the day. Because again, you know, the meditative practice is meant to be a way of life. And so we want to use these tools to build that foundation. Now, the, the next thing to think about is to have a successful meditation practice, it's always evolving. And I, you know, I've been studying the meditative arts for over 30 years and I'm not the master. I'm just a student. I'm learning all the time, you know, and gotcha. it's, you, you want to be in a place where you can always grow and get to a deeper level of practice. And that's, what's going to make you successful with, with a meditative practice. So you, you've alluded to this point a couple of times within a podcast, and I don't think we really dug into it a whole lot. You talk about ritual meditation, you talk about active meditation. Is there any other forms or whenever you say ritual, let me clean this question up for you. Let me re-ask this question. Whenever you say ritual and active for the listener that's not, I guess, can't really follow along with what you're saying, could you explain the difference between ritual and active? And if there is another form of meditation, uh, you can go into that as well. Yes. So a ritual meditation is where you set time aside every day. And again, it could be 20 minutes. It could be two hours, whatever that is mm -hmm. for you. And you just kind of check out. You're, you're, you're not in front of a TV. You're not in front of your phone. You are listening internally, you know, and I've, seen people so many times through the years say, oh yeah, I, you know, I practice meditation. I listen to this audio or I, I watch this video and do this guided meditation. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great for learning something, but yeah. true meditation when we want to have in our ritual is where we're looking internally, not looking at an exterior screen or listening to something outside of ourselves. And so mm -hmm. that ritual practice is that one-on-one -on -one time with yourself where you're taking off that mask and you're just listening to what's going on inside yourself. Right. An active practice, and these I love because you can do it every 60 minutes, you know, as often as you like. And it could be as simple as taking a pause at your desk and counting 10 breaths and just kind of rechecking in and getting to... Uh, a little bit more of a present or aware state throughout the day. And if we do that mm -hmm. every 60 or 90 minutes all day long, now our overall awareness on the five regulations is becoming more in tune. And we're starting to you know, develop the lifestyle of a meditation practitioner rather than a mm -hmm. hobbyist. And, and that's where all the true benefits lie is developing that lifestyle. Gotcha. So it's just ritual and active are those two types of meditation that we can go into. Yeah. There's well, also there's so, also the philosophical yeah. side. And the philosophical side of the meditative practice can be used either in active practices or ritual practices. And so that's kind of something you can weave into with that. So in there, uh, the last question that we, because we, we've hit a lot of points, but this last question I want to ask you is, uh, are there cues that maybe a quick meditation is needed in the moment of a stressful situation? In those situations, how do we bring ourselves back down to the grounded state to perform at our highest level? So I guess, are there certain signals from our body that, that we could use and say, well, I need to take this moment and meditate before acting or meditate before making a decision or meditate on this um, before... Um, you know, performing. And I'm not saying like, you know, an hour long, but maybe you need to take that quick moment to actively count breaths or things like that. Um, are there moments that are certain cues that we can use on ourselves? Or is that something that we kind of have to just be aware of ourselves to know if we need to use that tool? Yes. And, and that's part of the beauty of the practice is when you start a meditative practice and you're consistent with it, you are able to settle and really be able to find your center. And once you find your center, it's easy to see, 
when it starts to get disturbed and that could be mm. getting disturbed mentally with a disruption of your breath with maybe tension in the body and when again when you start to see things when they're like this it's easy to make the adjustment and if you know how to use the breath as a tool when you see these adjustments that are needed mm -hmm. you can use the breath to guide them before they get too far out and and you know you right. kind of hit the nail on the head is that's one of the big benefits of the practice is when we do start to see these disturbances meditation gives you the tools to guide you in that positive direction so you don't get too far off track exactly and we gotta we gotta end with this one so this is a fun question we've been talking to you guys about meditation a lot and um i know that you guys have gotten a lot of great things because we've been able to or not we because this episode mr patterson has been able to elude and and guide us uh in in the meditative practices and kind of what that entails and it's honestly a breath of fresh air to just kind of, I love talking about the mind and I love talking about the spiritual state of things. And I think that the older that I've gotten, I, I realize that those are more precursors to success than always using br brute strength and brute force to uh, to knock down walls or to go through things and, and, and things that, that serve you and, and help you to be, become successful. But the last question is something that we're going to kind of use to just kind of be fun. If you could have a conversation with your future self, what advice would you ask for? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I've, I've heard the flip side of that question a hundred times, but I've never heard anybody ask it that way before. Um, <laughs> so that's a little bit more difficult to answer, but I think that if I could do that, <clears throat> I would ask my future self if there was anything that I could do to be more of a positive influence on my kids and in my community. Mm. That's a great answer. That's, that's a good thinking point right there. Um, Mr. Patterson, I'm, I'm uh, glad that you joined the podcast. A great episode, uh, a lot of great insight, um, and a lot of great thinking points. Definitely got to get you back on because I would like to talk more so about a few different topics so you know we can we can definitely schedule that and get that going uh i appreciate you for for jumping on the podcast and as always uh, until next time for everybody listening don't forget to like share comment subscribe rate the podcast and be legendary all right from this point i'll make sure i chop that up but i would really like to get you back on if you ever have time to talk about like breath work and things like that um, for sure to 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 uh to dig a little bit more into that because it's a lot of things about meditation you taught me a lot because i used to like i said I, my my thing on meditation was uh that you know you kind of sit in the floor and I, and even with me i I use some of those guided meditations too and those things really put me to sleep a lot <laughs> right. uh i think it's just like the lack of of using my brain like um i don't know if that's normal or not like when i completely shut my brain off I don't know if my body just relaxed or what, but I just kind of be like, oh, I got to go sleep. Uh, and so, um, yeah, you, you definitely taught me a lot in that in that respect. In the beginning, sometimes it's easier to maybe pick up a, a movement meditative practice to just mm -hmm. help with, you know, doing like some Qigong or some Tai Chi. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's a good way to start, I think, for a lot of people. I've seen, uh, I, I guess it's kind of funny because I was kind of like you and I've seen, I've seen Tai Chi before. And I, <laughs> I've seen it in movies, but I was like, I, I don't really know how that works, but it's it's cool to see. And so that that's definitely something I think I'll, I'll be picking up um, here in the future and, and using some of that stuff as practice. I know for uh, some of the athletes that I work with and things like that, I, I usually talk about meditation um, and visual and visualization of the outcomes that you want to see and and taking yourself there mentally for uh, a, a lot of people that I've run into and come into contact with, I guess it's the cell phones. I'm not sure, but it's hard to quiet the mind a lot of times. Yeah. And I don't know if that's just due to distractions that we have today, uh, the instant messages and, and things like that. But quieting the mind is, is probably one of the hardest things that, uh, most people have problems with 
Uh, remember, that's not the goal. Re- that? re- remember, quieting the mind is not the goal. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's true. <laughs> but it's it's just hard to create that focus. Uh, and I think it's just the more I, I'm around, especially like younger athletes today, it's, I can just see where it's getting harder to help them focus on the tasks that are right there in front of them or at hand. And so for sure, I think that meditative practices, I honestly think that that's going to become something that people kind of look to more in the future, uh, more than anything in a distracted world that we live in. Yeah. I've definitely over the last 20 years seen meditation multiply many times over. Mm-hmm. And it's very few people. I think it's very few people that can teach it. Like you said, going seven months and really having to be disciplined with the practice before learning something else is not, that's not the popular or common thing today um, because people want variety and they want the results like now. Yep. So that's, that just makes everything a lot different. Mm-hmm.